Um, some extrinsic uh, variables is actually just the skills of themselves. So we see ankle sprains occur primarily during attacking and blocking. It's actually a great research paper that was recently published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that talks about this specifically. That came out this summer. So how do we prevent ankle sprains from occurring? Uh, there's a couple of ideas. Uh, the most common and the one that I'm sure we're all well aware of are ankle braces. Um, and ankle braces do work, and there's quite a bit of literature that show that ankle braces will reduce um, ankle sprains. And contrary to popular belief, there's not a lot of literature that shows wearing an ankle brace increases knee injuries. So that isn't really there. So um, seems like there's quite a bit of support for ankle braces and uh, to back up having your athletes wear ankle braces. However, there's some other options we can do as well. Uh, one is um, an intervention type prevention, and this is actually through balance board training. So this research came out in about 2007, I believe, and it came out of Holland. And what they found was that doing kind of a balance board training program of six to eight weeks was just as effective at reducing ankle sprains as wearing ankle braces. So a balance board training program of some sort, site and uh, of some type, sorry, and um, and can be just as good as, as wearing ankle braces at trying to reduce um, ankle sprains. Um, and then the last one is really the coaching interaction. I'll try and get through, talk about this quite a bit, but one piece that I think we need to consider is what do we do and how do we handle um, tight attack block interactions at the net? Um, these are going to happen, they're part of our sport, but how can we try and reduce the, um, you know, the frequency at which they occur within our sport? So one way, uh, one idea that I've seen um, used, I think it was actually Oregon State Women's Volleyball was using this, was they changed the center line um, rule. And this is something that's also been flo floated around a little bit at the international level, and I know it's in conferences there, is actually changing the rule so that the attacking player is not allowed to touch the center line after attacking the ball. The blocking player who's standing at the net and jumps straight up and down, they almost always do land on that center line. But the attacking player, um, you know, they kind of float into that zone. So one thing that I've seen done is, is in practice anyways, I've never seen it done in kind of a match, but in a practice environment, anytime the attacking player lands on that center line, doesn't matter if they're all the way under or not, any contact at all with the line means that they are immediately uh, considered to be under the net. Um, and what we find, what I've done, I've done this in my gym a little bit, is we see athletes starting to uh, jump further off the net and setters intentionally setting the ball a little farther off the net, uh, which is frequently what we want to do anyways um, from an efficiency perspective um, as well. Okay, ankle sprains. Acute knee injuries. Uh, so these are really your ligament damage. So this is the blown ACLs, MCLs, PCL, you know, whatever other kind of acute damage that occurs. Um, and this is far, far more common in female volleyball than it is in male volleyball. Okay, uh, so some intrinsic risk factor. Again, balance has, seems, uh, has been found in some studies. Uh, just being female is going to increase your risk factor. Um, landing technique. So there's some research out there that talks about landing technique um, and specifically uh, looking at the, uh, the amount of what's called knee valgus, so medial, um, how much your kind of knees touch together. Um, how close your knees get during the, the landing phase. And that's also kind of talked about as dynamic knee control. So the ability to control those knees from not coming together. Um, the extrinsic risk factors is still attacking and blocking. Um, so these uh, blown ACLs still usually occur during uh, the attacking and blocking phase. Um, and it doesn't always occur with contact. So we do see quite a few ACL tears um, in female volleyball that also is non-contact related, but still comes from the attacking skill usually in that, in that situation. So how do we prevent it? Um, well, we could just put all of our athletes in these gigantic knee braces to prevent the, the knee valgus that we talked about earlier. Um, that is one thing we could do, but unlikely that we're going to, and honestly it hasn't been looked at, and we don't know if that actually would prevent it. We assume it would though, but um, not likely uh, an, uh, an appropriate one. So then there's another one, and, and this really comes more from soccer, and soccer developed this thing called the FIFA 11 Plus uh, program. It's a neuromuscular warm-up protocol. It takes between 10 and 15 minutes. It's a graduated protocol, um, and it's part of base, the athlete's warm-up. And what it has is a lot of kind of jump and stick maneuvers, lateral maneuvers, jumping and landing, um, and a lot of stuff trying to land with proper technique and trying to keep, keep the knee in, in a healthier place during different cutting and jumping and landing 
um, tasks. Um, it's been found to be extremely effective at reducing ACL tears in um, youth, fall, in youth soccer. Sorry, uh, some work has also been done in basketball and showed a decrease in total injuries in that population. Um, so similar work such as that or dynamic uh, neuromuscular training program as a warm-up protocol in particular could be really effective in the volleyball population as well. Um, to date, nothing has been um, created for that, uh, but I think there's certainly some, some evidence that it could be effective. Okay, so this is just an image here, just wanting to show that dynamic valgus. So this is really the position that the knee goes into when we see the AC. Sorry. Uh, so one thing that we need to consider is, is how to teach proper landing technique. So trying to teach our athletes that when they jump and land, that they don't land with valgus, they land with that strong knee control. Um, and then again, just reducing tight attack block interactions. Although not as frequently, um, they, we still do see ACL tears from landing on other people's feet, um, but we do see them without. But still, uh, nonetheless, if we can reduce that interaction, we'll probably reduce ankle sprains and we'll reduce ACLs. Okay, so we'll change gears a little bit and get into some of our overuse injuries. Uh, so overuse injuries, uh, throw a bunch of stuff up here. First of all, this primarily encompasses what we call jumper's knee. And some of us have maybe heard of jumper's knee before. Uh, jumper's knee is kind of an all-encompassing term that captures uh, patellar tendinopathy or quadricep tendinopathy. Tendinopathy used to be called tendinitis, tendinitis or tendinosis, or um, it's got a kind of bunch of inter um, used uh, terms. Uh, it also captures those things like osgood schlatters or Singer's larsen syndrome, which are more what they call apophyseal injuries, which is basically like the tendon pulling off the bone, whether it's pulling off the patella, um, then that would be Singer's larsen, or if it's pulling off the tibia or off the shin, um, then that's good osgood schlatters. And that occurs more as athletes are still in their developmental phases and growth plates haven't closed and they're still growing. And at adults, we don't have Osgoods or Singer's Larsons. Um, it's, it's primarily the patellar or quadricep tendinopathy. Um, this is really, really common within our sport. Uh, numbers by study vary anywhere between about 26% and as high as 80% of male volleyball players uh, tend to be reporting jumper's knee. It's about half that in those studies um, that have both male and female. Female rates seem to be about half as high as male rates. A um, bunch of different risk factors on why that occurs and why some athletes uh, develop this and others don't. Uh, one is jumping ability. So it's been found that just athletes that jump higher um, have a higher rate of developing jumper's knee. And that kind of makes sense. There's just more force going through the knee joint, uh, both during the concentric takeoff phase as well as during the eccentric landing phase. Um, another one is ankle range of motion. There's kind of mixed uh, data uh, on this one, but one theory is that Athletes that don't have a strong range of motion through the ankle joint, uh, they won't absorb the landing phase with their ankle at all. So they'll land really flat footed and then they'll absorb all of that force through the knee joint. Um, and therefore, uh, they would have uh, more force there and therefore a higher risk. And then the last one is landing technique. And this is similar to the ankle range of motion, but also looking at how um, soft they land. So what is the amount of force that is produced during the landing maneuver? And there's some evidence here to show that those athletes that have softer landing strategies, so using the ankle as well as absorbing through the hips and glutes um, and kind of sinking in versus um, landing with real rigid straight legs um, has been protective, um, the soft landing techniques for uh, development of overuse knee injuries. Some extrinsic, um, well, attacking and blocking, because that's where we get our maximal jumps. That's where we seem to jump our highest and, uh, and our, we have those greatest loads. Um, jump load, and I'm going to go into this a lot more, but that's kind of just our total amount of jumping. So how much load do we have? So obviously those come primarily from attacking and blocking, but that can come from serving or setting or other skills as well. Um, position. So we know that outsides um, and middles uh, end up having a uh, higher rate of overuse injuries compared to setters and liberos, say. So some preventative measures. Um, there's some good evidence that uh, patella straps or taping of the patella, um, in particular just below the knee, um, can really reduce the pain. It doesn't actually treat the injury, it doesn't actually make the tendon any healthier, um, but we do know that it makes the tendon feel get better, and the athletes report kind of having lower pain levels uh, when they do do that. All right, let's get into lower back. Here's a good photo of what we don't want to see and, and why we maybe see lower back injuries in volleyball. So lower back is really, an, it's an overuse um, injury. Um, 
And so we usually don't see over, uh, lower back issues that occur from those specific inciting events. It's usually a chronic thing that kind of builds up over time. Um, not a lot of research, to be honest, in this area within the sport of volleyball. Um, so the theory is that it kind of comes more from attacking. So if we can measure jump loads, then potentially we can measure the attack loads and maybe there's something there building up the capacity of the lower back. But I actually think that the preventative measures here are more around coaching. Um, and so this is where I really am a firm advocate of, of trying to teach an arm swing technique that has a lot more what we call torque or trunk rotation. So you see this athlete here, they're, they actually have some really good what we'd call T-spine rotation. So their right shoulder is far behind their left shoulder. But we want to try and generate our force for that while trying to minimize the amount of hyperextension that we see um, here in the image. Okay, uh, we'll get into shoulder injuries. Um, so again, this is another over common overuse injury that we see. Um, risk factors, this ha sorry, I should, first of all, I should say that this in the literature has not been studied well in volleyball. There's just a handful of papers out there. However, it has been studied extensively in other throwing dominated sports such as baseball or actually European handball. So one thing we know from those sports that we can assume can transfer with our sports is just swing volume. So this is like your pitch count in baseball. So just having excessive pitch counts that are above the capacity of what the shoulder can handle. Um, one way to assess for this or what we found is what we call the glenohumeral rotational strength difference. And if you're interested in that, you can look it up. And, but basically it's looking at the difference um, in movement between your dominant throwing arm versus your other arm. Um, and this kind of falls in line as well with our asymmetric um, pectoralis or, or chest muscle flexibility from one side to the other. So what we see is athletes that have greater symmetry there and more balanced strength between uh, the two arms seem to have a lower rate of overuse chronic shoulder injuries across a multitude of sports. Um, we know that in our sport, obviously, athletes are going to develop one side a lot more than the other. But if we can do that while trying to maintain, not allowing that shoulder um, to get, you know, too much stronger than the other side and or too um, stiff and, and inflexible, uh, then we can hopefully reduce the, uh, the rate of chronic shoulder injuries. So some preventative measures, honestly, not a whole lot here other than maybe adjusting our load um, as well as uh, on the equipment side. Um, it's just kind of doing some sort of trying to use a warm up protocol of some sort. So this can be our TeraBand work um, and just trying to work on both our strength differences as well as our flexibility asymmetry. Um, and then from the coaching, as I mentioned, just kind of gradually increasing our load. And I'll talk about this more from a jumping perspective later, uh, but I, I think that the same theory can really hold true uh, from a swinging perspective uh, for shoulder injuries. And then the last one, and this is one I just kind of want to just touch on because it's been brought up a few times and I've heard a few people talk to me about it. Um, and this is really kind of more theoretical, but we, this is around coaching and the thought of doing what we call a low elbow draw. What I mean by this is when we draw back to attack, um, when we draw our dominant or hitting arm back, drawing it with our elbow below the height of our shoulder. So frequently we see coaches trying to teach, you know, palm out in the draw phase and they want that elbow up above the shoulder height. And there's a little bit of literature um, out there and there's some theory out there that that actually might create some sort of an impingement and not allow the shoulder to swing naturally through its comfortable range. So an example that you can see here is between two different hitters. And um, so the hitter on top is uh, what we have, what we call a high elbow draw. So that elbow is up above the shoulder. Whereas the hitter on the bottom, uh, top guy is a Russian guy, hitter on the bottom is, our, is Clayton Stanley. And he's got that real low, low elbow draw. Um, so these two, uh, it's just a single example, but the top guy I believe has had three surgeries, um, whereas the bottom guy, Clayton Stanley, has never reported having a shoulder problem in his life. Both guys hit the ball just about as hard and have had similar playing careers playing in the same position. Um, so this is kind of being shown um, across a multitude of situations and looking at the, the specific technique of those international players um, that have had history of shoulder issues. So something to be kind of considered here, but definitely um, the jury's out on whether this is truly the case. Um, if you're more interested in this, there is a bit of a, a link there at the bottom. I'm happy to share this link um, via email or something after. Uh, if you want to read more on, on that blog um, that a physiotherapist has around this theory. All right, uh, volleyball concussions. Um, so this is actually coming back now to the studies that we did with uh, Volleyball Canada, because there's really no um, information out there in the literature around concussions in our sport. So the survey that we did last year and the questions that we asked was kind of the first one globally um, to look at this. So what we found was that there was a what we call a one-year cumulative incidence 
of 7.1 concussions per 100 athletes. So essentially 7.1% of our youth volleyball uh, population is sustaining a concussion um, every year. Um, so that was actually considered fairly high um, and it was surprising uh, to many that, that our number was actually that high. So what we see total was that we had 86 total concussions and 52 in the previous year out of our, out of our total population. Um, a little bit more interesting is diving into that is within, specifically within those concussions, is bald ahead seems to be the mechanism that's accounting for well over half of the concussions. So in our study, it was 48 of all reported concussions uh, were bald ahead versus 17 player and 13 head to floor and six were kind of in other category. Okay, um, so we gotta be a little concerned here, um, but it looks like that might be something that we can work on from preventative nature. And I'll, I'll explain two things that we're doing. First of all is one other piece that came out of the survey was that we found that game concussion totals were 33 versus hitting warm-up on practice concussion totals was 53. This is almost unheard of in sport that we see concussion rates higher or concussions occurring more frequently in a non-competitive environment, that being the hitting warm-up of a game and or in a practice. So um, there's a huge opportunity here to try and reduce that from occurring. Um, likelihood is that why is this occurring? It's people getting hit in the head when they just don't see the ball coming. And in practice and in hitting warm-up, there's multiple balls flying all over the place. Whereas in the game, there's really one ball coming. So athletes usually can kind of pre um, predict ball flight a little bit better when there's only one ball and they can brace themselves. If they are gonna get hit in the head, they'll drop their head. And they'll use um, uh, techniques such as that that we do find kind of reduces the probability of concussion. Uh, the last piece is around ball, and, and don't worry about these graphs here, I just kind of threw them in there to give you an idea, but um, maybe there's something around the types of balls that we're using. And so this is some a theory that was put out there. This is some initial findings that came back from a, a master's student actually here at UBC that I'm working with. I'm um, looking at different ball types and looking at what we call a coefficient of restitution, which is basically just kind of like the impact force that these different balls um, will have and the amount of force that they transfer through to the head uh, when you get hit in the head with them. So this was some initial work. What we see is there are differences. The balls aren't all exactly the same. So we see differences between balls. So we're actually now about to start up phase two of this. Or fun job now is we're actually launching uh, volleyballs through a serving machine off of a 3D head form and uh, and looking at the impact forces uh, with on that, within that 3D head form to see is there a specific ball that we should be using uh, to help reduce the po uh, possibility of concussions uh, within our population. Cool, so this, going back, I showed you this graph earlier, but kind of going through, and what you'll see is that, I mean, the in red here, these are our overuse injuries, versus in blue are our acute. So really our, our acute injuries are those ankles, hands, and thumbs that we see, um, the head and face being concussions. So kind of checked all those ones off. And then our overuse injuries being the knee, shoulder, and lower back, and we've kind of gone through those ones as well. So now I'm gonna get a little bit more into the overuse stuff and uh and this bit a little bit more so i like to use the example of kind of couch to 5k and this is an example of an app that you can download for your phone and uh, for running so if you've never say run a 5k uh, before i've never run five kilometers um no running coach out there would ever tell you well just go and run 5k tomorrow you'll be fine um they'd say well no maybe like build up especially if you're being sediment sediment or you have a sedimentary life and you spend, spend most of your time on the couch they're gonna say let's really build up so let's maybe start with you know, a couple hundred meters running and walking, you know, and eventually build up to the point of it, you can run 5K continuously. So this gradual increase is well known and it's well known across a lot of sports. That same theory is really what we now believe is what we need to do to prevent overuse injuries. And what we mean by that is trying to develop capacity to withstand um, the loads of our sport. Um, so if we know that in a five set match, we have say five, 400 jumps or something like that for one position, then what we would wanna do is we wanna gradually build up to that number over a specific period of time, as opposed to just having the athletes coming, say, coming back from the summer, having taken two months off, and then go straight into playing a five set match. Um, we know that that's likely not gonna be healthy, um, and that's likely if we do that repeatedly over time, we're gonna see chronic um, injuries occur. Um, there's a lot of research now kind of backing up this theory. Um, a lot of this work is done by Tim Gabbett. This is just a, a simple example of one of those. Um, but looking at just high training loads are actually not the issue. 
but it's how we get there. So what they talk about is trying again, the same theory, just trying to build up. And if we can stay in, in kind of a sweet spot and not increase too quickly, um, then we can actually keep the athletes healthier when we see injury risk is lower. So this is now being shown across a multitude of sports, looking at a multitude of injuries. And I'll go into how we're now looking at this within volleyball. Okay, so this is our UBC approach. So this is a photo of our team from last year and what we're trying to do. So first of all, I mentioned earlier, but uh, load monitoring. So we try and measure load in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, the most rudimentary way that we can all measure load, so coaches with no technology whatsoever, is we can measure what we call exposure hours. So exposure hours is just how many hours have you, are you actually playing the sport. So that's kind of the most basic measure of load. Uh, what we do is uh, we take it a step further and we use these devices called uh, VERT. So it's a commercially available, um, what's called an IMU or inertial measurement unit, um, made by a company out of Florida. Uh, the company is called Mayfunk, and uh, what it does is it tracks every single jump that you take and the magnitude of all of those jumps. Um, all that data is then sent um, to an iPad in real time, so we can track 8 to 10 athletes on one iPad. Uh, so within our gym, we have 18 athletes, we have two iPads running at the same time. Uh, we've validated this device, uh, that was some work that I did in my PhD, so we know that it's quite accurate. So the jump height values are within kind of two centimeters plus or minus um, what we find using a 3D motion capture system. So it's quite accurate and it captures most jumps and it doesn't miss too many. So this is a really good way of for us looking at load. So now this is what the output looks like. So this is us tracking every athlete, say, um, I guess say 10 athletes over one practice. We can then break that down and we can look specifically just at one athlete and we can pull out their individual measure of load from there. Okay, uh, so from that, we then try and look at this uh, a little bit differently. So what we try and do is we create this measure that we call our acute load. So our acute load is our seven day average. So this is how much have we done over the previous seven days. And the way we like to try and think of this is, this is kind of our fatigue. So how much have we fatigued the system over the past week? And then our chronic load is our average of how much we've jumped over the past 28 days. So over the past month. And that's kind of uh, like a measure of our fitness. So we're trying to say, what's our fitness, our fatigue? How much are we fatiguing the system compared to what is our fitness? What can our system handle? And we look at this seven to 28 day. So this is called the acute chronic workload ratio. And it's really kind of a, a buzzword and super trendy right now within sport analytics and the injury prevention type of stuff. Um, we exponentially weight this, and I won't get into the details, it's, it's more stats than we probably need to talk about, but basically the load that is being more current or more frequent to present day is has a higher value, whereas the load that happened 28 days ago, we're not going to consider that that's as impactful on our fitness scores. Um, so the two kind of, it just kind of ends exponentially weights over time. Again, this is that sweet spot that we talked about. So when we take our average over one week and then we divide it by average over four weeks, if they are the same value, we would have a load measure of one. So on this graph here, that would be kind of down in this zone. Um, if you can see it in green and just a little bit on either side, that would be kind of our sweet spot. So what the literature says is kind of if you're down in this like 0.7 to 1.3 ratio between those two values, we see injury risk seems quite low. Then when we increase our, our uh, that acute chronic workload ratio and we end up with ratios that are above this 1.5 threshold. So that would be the example of um, a seven day average of 150 jumps compared to the 28 day average of 100. That would be an acute chronic workload ratio of 1.5. And when we get into that range and higher, this is where, especially when we get into like doubling our loads, um, that's when we start seeing injury risk just take off. So we go from being in kind of a 5% risk and, and all the way up to like into the 20 percent um, percentile. So three and four times doubling the probability of an athlete getting injured. So what we try and do obviously is we're trying to stay in the green zone. So here's a little bit of what that looks like and, and some of the stuff that we can now pull from our birth data. So I'll go through a bunch of different things that we do. So first is we look at jump count, um, which is in blue. So these are all vertical blue bars. And this is real data from an athlete of ours at the end of last season. So on the left-hand column, uh, we have our jump count. So we have the athlete jumping, say, around 100 times, spiking up, say, 150 to 170, then up to 200, and their highest spikes being just over 200, 210 jumps within a, given, within a singular day. So that's how much they're loaded. 
And then what we can start to assess is, well, how are they performing? So how are they able to handle and uh, are they still jumping maximally? Um, and if we go too high and low, do we see drops? So this actually helps our strength and conditioning team a lot. So in orange here is the average height of what we consider our high jumps. So these are those jumps that are kind of over in our sport, over 20 inches in height. So what is the average of that value? So what we see with our athlete here is their averages actually were really high on days that they had really high loads. So it doesn't seem that having a really high load means that the athlete can't jump as high and fatigues and starts to drop off. Um, we don't see that at all. So that's a good thing. It kind of shows us anyways that the athletes um, over high matches can maintain all their real high jumps. So from a performance perspective, that's really good. And that's just another piece that we can kind of pull out of this. Um, we can then look at what we call an acute jump count. So this is the same thing. We're just looking at a, this is the smoothing effect on the last data set. So I go from the last data set, kind of spikes up and down. This is now just looking at kind of a seven day average. So now what this allows me to do is how are we trending? Are we trending up or are we trending down kind of over a seven day rolling average? So we can see, you know, undulations in both the training load as well as kind of this gradual increase in say their jump height. Then we saw a drop off in their jump height. And then we saw another increase. And what was really neat is we basically see them peaking and jumping, you know, at this was our U Sport National Championships. You know, this athlete is jumping an average of 35 inches, um, you know, on the last day. So that's awesome. That's what we want to see is that the ability, you know, our tapering is working and the athletes are jumping higher. Um, now, I'll talk about the pain scales because really this is about injury prevention. Um, so th what we do with our athletes is we collect um, at the conclusion of the warm up. Um, these pain scales. So the athletes have seen this graph, they've seen enough times that we don't even need to show it to them anymore. And we just ask them, what is your knee pain today, back pain today, or shoulder pain today? And they gave us a, new, a numeric number, somewhere between zero and 10. Um, and then we enter that as well into our data set. And this allows us to kind of program and, and adjust our loads. So um, here's another graph showing the same jump count that I showed you before, but now it has on in orange is all of our knee pain scores. So our knee pain score is kind of fluctuating as our jump, jump counts fluctuate. Um, so what we don't see, which we would maybe expect to see, is that when the jump count goes up, the knee pain goes up. And that's one off, so it doesn't actually happen. There's one there um, on February 17th, uh, that hopefully you can see my cursor uh, here, that we see the jump count was high, and all of a sudden we see this spike in knee pain. But then when we spike the jump count even higher um, a week later, we didn't see that same kind of increase. The knee pain was actually a little bit lower, so it wasn't too bad. So now what we can do is we can actually monitor and adjust our athletes on a daily um, basis based on having this information. But um, what we were talking about earlier is these kind of smoothing effects and looking at what was our fatigue value um, so uh, over, over time. So this now looks at our acute jump load. So as, are we gradually increasing or gradually decreasing? And here we kind of see that we did. We kind of gradually increased that jump load up. We saw the spike go up. And even though we had some high days later on, um, you don't see that increase in pain. And you don't see it maybe because our averages weren't that high. So one-offs maybe aren't the issue, but maybe it's the chronic or the ability to do that over time that's really going to cause the pain. And then this last value here is this is our acute chronic workload ratio. So I showed you the, the graph before, and it was actually flipped. The green bar went uh, north to south or up or down. This one goes left to right. So what we want to try and do is we want to keep these blue um, bars, our acute chronic workload ratio, in this green range. So this is considered a good ratio. The one time we actually went above that ratio, uh, we, de we did see that jump in knee pain. And then when we were able to keep our, our values within that ratio, we were able to maintain and uh, the knee pain spikes weren't that high. So this is an example anyways of, of what we're doing here now with UBC. And we're actually just in the process of about to roll this out as well with, uh, with our national team and the, uh, the full-time training center, but I know they just rebranded, whatever it's, it's now called there in Gatineau. Okay, so just, just wrapping up some of this. So understanding these acute chronic worker load ratios, it really allows us now to actually prescribe load. So based on our current ratio, um, I know that a change of load tomorrow of X number would result in acute chronic workload ratio for that athlete of X. So what I can do is I can actually go into practice being like, hey, this athlete is, needs to jump about this high in order to keep them in that green zone. But if they go to this high, then they're going to go above that green zone into the red where we don't want them to be. So I can go into practice and I can sit down and plan practice ahead of time, knowing what those ranges are for every athlete within our group. Um, and then I can really optimize that as well 
uh, for things like performance and trying to taper as well. So that tapering effect, and I can see how that, what impact that's having on performance too. Okay, so some summaries. Um, so most injuries uh, occur during kind of those blocking and attacking skills that I mentioned earlier, uh, both acute and over, overuse. Um, so we just need to be aware of that and think about how we handle that. Um, it's also, we need to be considerate of load and capacity because really attacking and blocking is where we really develop a lot of these, um, we, we stress the load and we need to understand what the capacity is. Um, we can reduce the risk of uh, those tight net interactions as we talked previously, maybe modifying our center line rule or just really discussing it. And, uh, you know, in our gym, one thing we do is if it's really tight, if the attacker chooses to not jump, we just automatically offer a reserve. They feel if they would have jumped, they would have landed on the blocker, then don't. Uh, don't jump and then we'll just reserve that ball at, at no punishment and, and hopefully our athletes can just stay healthy. Uh, I mentioned earlier, but obviously the best predictor of future injury is past injury. Um, so really know your injury history of, of, of your players and of your athletes. Be gradual in that return to play. And a concept that I think is important for the chronic injury uh, in particular is that playing through high levels of pain is not necessary. We're always going to have some pain, um, but one way that we can, especially when we're talking to younger athletes, pain in between joints, um, that's called muscle soreness. That's usually okay. Pain within joints is rarely a good thing. So that's one way we can try to understand the difference between just being sore and being injured. Uh, last one, so landing technique. So we talked about that knees over toes, so eliminating the valgus or the knees kissing together. Um, landing soft, um, ideally landing on two feet. That'll help us dissipate the force between two legs as opposed to one. Uh, some arm swing stuff we talked about, that trunk rotation or developing torque. Um, that's a really important way of trying to develop force and it seems to not cause a lot of injuries. Reducing the extensive back arch that we talked about and maybe there's something about a, a, low, uh, a low elbow draw. All right, so that kind of wraps up there. I did see one question pop in, so let me just uh, pop out of this and I'll try and get into some questions. So yeah, feel free, we can fire some questions away and. Uh, Go from there. So let me pull that up first. Though. I just saw it came up on my screen. How do I get to that? Chat. Sorry, guys. Just trying to figure out where I can see the uh, where I can get to see the questions. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Got it here. Okay, so is there any evidence the use of ankle braces contributes to weakening of the joints? Um, really good question. I haven't seen any scientific literature around that that talks about um, weakening the joints. However, I mean, I think we can practically understand that uh, if we wear an ankle brace, um, we're not, and we're reducing the range at which that ankle um, is naturally going through. There's a good chance that that ankle is, is not going to be potentially as strong as, as an ankle that has um, gone through those different ranges and experienced those different forces. Um, so there definitely could be something there. Uh, but, but what we do know is that athletes that do wear ankle braces chronically, it's not like they're at a higher risk of also receiving ankle sprains. So um, yeah, the ankle brace one's a really common question and one that, that people ask a lot. And what I try and say is that, you know, we do a lot of work here on kind of what I call prehabilitation on trying to develop some really strong and robust ankles and we do a lot of balance type work and on one legged and jumping and landing stuff and sticking our landings and so we try and do a lot of stuff to strengthen the ankle so I'm optimistic that our group is is at a situation where their ankles are just as good at preventing um, sprains as if they were wearing braces but we do take it a step further and I'll be honest in, in match play a lot of our athletes still tape ankles and we do have some athletes that do still wear braces um, um, I'm particularly a fan of, of wearing braces in the return to play protocol. Um, so most athletes that come back from ankle sprains, uh, they take the brace off too soon or they don't wear a brace at all. They think the ankle is good, but they really haven't properly re rehabbed that ankle. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of that, uh, of not wearing a brace kind of in that, in that return to play piece. So um, yeah, so on, on that side, I, I, I'm a fan of braces. I think they really play a strong role though in um, when you're returning from injury. Uh, and just one last thing I'll just mention on um, on ankle braces is we did mention about with overuse knee braces, so particularly in, in male volleyball player, I don't love ankle braces that really restrict what we call plantar um, flexion and dorsiflexion, where it's like the ability to point the toe and curl the toe up, because going through that range is kind of a natural 
uh, motion that we want to be able to go through to land um, and to absorb forces. Uh, so I'm more of a fan of, of braces that don't restrict that. So the lace-up braces usually restrict that a little bit um, more so than other braces that say have a joint built into them to allow for that plantar dorsiflexion. But that's really more for athletes that do have chronic knee injuries. If the athlete doesn't have any history of chronic knee problems, I wouldn't worry about that. But if they do, I would look at the brace and see if, if maybe a brace that allows for more plantar dorsiflexion uh, would help them absorb through the ankle and take some of that force off the knee. Any other questions? Hope I'm looking in the right place to see them if they do pop up. Oh, there we go. Uh, what age would you begin braces if you wear to wear them? Um, I personally, I mean, I'm a fan of, of not, I would like to say not, not wear them until you need them. Um, I would like to think that, you know, if we can do some good work, as I said, around, around strengthening the ankle, um, we don't see, I mean, they will prevent that first time injury and that's for sure. Um, it's a really good question. I, I mean, ideally, I would like to see us trying to do some prehab stuff and maybe not wear them as much, but maybe wear them in situations where you know there's a higher risk. Um, it's a really good question, though. I don't, I don't have all the answers on that one. Uh, if it's a, I would say if it's a female volleyball player, younger um, than male volleyball players, but where exactly I would draw the line in the sand on that, I'm not sure. Maybe when they get in more situations where, you know, you see athletes that, you know, are jumping tighter than that and, you know, and coming down from higher heights and um, situations like that, um, you know, more situationally based, uh, depending on, on level of play a little bit. But I would I would push them off a little bit more on the men's side. And then actually the reason for that is just because what we see is, the burden of injury of chronic knee injury seems to be a lot higher than ankle sprains. Ankle sprains kind of, you know, this sucks for a couple of weeks, but then, you know, brace it and then do a good rehab program and you're back to back to being okay. Where these chronic knee injuries that we're seeing, um, like right now with our university athletes, most of our athletes are coming to our program with three and four years of chronic knee injuries. And I think the braces um, are maybe contributing a little bit to that, but kind of some personal opinion and not a lot of evidence to back a lot of that up, unfortunately. So, sorry for the kind of crappy answer there. Any other questions? I wonder how many people out here have heard of Vert, I guess, um, or are actively using it. Maybe someone. Type in. I know uh, son Nathan is on there. I know he just got some for his college team. Um, but I think I think the vert units is something that we're probably going to see a lot more athletes starting to use and wear, and and uh, you know and how we utilize that as, as you know youth high school and club coaches is going to be interesting because you get a lot of data. The new devices track every single movement that an athlete makes, not just the jumps, but they look at all movements and, and g forces and total joules of work performed and so, you know, it can be a bit of a paralysis uh, by analysis trying to handle all that data, but yeah, it's pretty cool uh, where, where things are going from a technology perspective. Cool. Well, I don't know if there's any other questions. Oh, sorry. Are, the, are there suggestions to separate school and club seasons to reduce load, especially in Ontario? Uh, that's a really good question, Calvin. Um, yeah, I, I don't know from what's going on with, you know, with Ontario Volleyball. Um, I know out here, uh, I'm here in BC and, and I came from Alberta, uh, things are almost moving the other way and that, you know, we're, there was jealousy that our club teams can't start training until December and January, uh, as opposed to starting up in September and October like you guys uh, get to do. So, um, and that was more from a development perspective and that the level of play is higher and, and, and nature and such as that. So. Um, I don't think there's, I don't know of anything going down the pipeline with that from, I was at the Volvo Canada AGM, so I haven't heard of anything, but I think there's definitely needs to be some, there's need for, there's reason for concern um, with athletes specializing so early and, 
uh, specializing so early and then the amount of load that they then would need to take if they're going from barbell practice to school practice and and you know and, and things of that uh, nature. So yeah, I, I don't know what's coming from Ontario volleyball and maybe they can speak more to that. Okay, so question between ankles and knees. If we work on the ankle prevention measures, would we reduce the risk of knee injuries or is it more intrinsic for extrinsic? Uh, good question. Um, so what we do know is that if we're working on the like trying to reduce ankle injuries, um, we're usually improving balance, and we know that improving balance uh, will reduce knee injuries as well. Uh, so that is one factor that's definitely uh, between the two. We also know that like those neuromuscular warm-up programs that I mentioned, like that FIFA 11 plus, we know that reduces all types of injuries. So that would reduce knee injuries as well as, as ankle injuries. Um, so yeah, injury prevention measures like those anyways like whether it be a balance type program a balance mode program or a neuromuscular intervention program um like on a feet like a FIFA 11 plus or something of that nature uh we would imagine that that would have uh injury prevention uh, impacts uh for both both injury types hopefully that answers the question Awesome. All right. Well, if there's any any other questions, if anyone has anything else, feel free to fire away. I'll hang out here for a little bit. But if nothing else pops up, uh, yeah, thanks for staying on the call and uh, listening to me as I sit here and talk to my computer. But hopefully it was beneficial. And uh, yeah, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is carry.macdonald.ubc.ca. So Feel free if there's other things that come up you want to chat about. Um, feel free to drop me an email. I'm happy to send any information that I have over. And uh, yeah, best of luck to everyone uh, this club season. You guys are already in club. We're not even talking about club level yet out here in BC. So best of luck. Yeah. Oh, another one here. Good. Um, starting point for neuromuscular intervention. Uh, good question, uh, Lisa, on that one. I would take a look, honestly. I the FIFA 11 plus program, um, it actually has kind of an introduction and it talks about it at different ages. There's even an app you can get on your phone. Um, so I would take a look at that specifically. Um, I know that the exact program was applied to a basketball population in a big study. They didn't really modify it too much. Um, and they found a real reduction in injuries there. It's really just kind of things that would be part of almost like a dynamic warm up type of piece. Um, so I would take a look at that FIFA 11 plus. And uh, my guess is you can kind of modify and adapt it and find kind of 10 minutes worth of stuff there. Um, and it kind of progresses through with enough change and variability that the athletes don't get bored doing the same thing every single day for an entire year. So um, that might be something you, uh, that'd be a good starting point anyways. There isn't anything specific yet, so for volleyball, but. Sounds good. Yeah, there is an app for that as well. I know it's there's an app. I think it's in the App Store uh, for sure. There there definitely is an app out there. Um, I actually think there's a IOC injury prevention app, so International Olympic Committee injury prevention app as well that you can get on your phone. That gives a bunch of different exercises, and I think you can build out um, a program there. I haven't done it myself. I was just told about it verbally from from another researcher. So. Uh, you might have to do a little bit of a look uh, into that. Yeah, single sport athletes more susceptible to injuries than multi sport athletes. Uh, great, great question, Kelvin. Um, this is a real hot topic uh, in the literature right now, and we're really on the verge of seeing this. Um, so the amount of evidence and the amount of data we have, uh, to be honest, is a, is a little minimal. Uh, there's some big, bigger stuff that's came out of the U.S. Nothing really right now out of Canada. Uh, nothing specifically looking at volleyball players, um, but there has been quite a bit of stuff looking at some other sports. Um, specifically, I know like soccer players and football players um, through, the, uh, through the U.S. and through NCAA. Um, athletes that had greater multi-sport experiences prior to joining the NCAA, for example, had lower injury rates while within the NCAA. So there's definitely uh, some stuff coming down the pipeline and some research coming this way uh, to really uh, encourage multi-sport athletes and the the theory that that would actually reduce in injuries. So yeah, it's definitely leaning that way. It's just a little thin right now on, on evidence for volleyball specifically and, and for Canadian sports in general. 
Sorry, my email address, yep, yeah, it's uh, it's just my name, so Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y. Um, actually, I think I can type it in here. Hold on. Uh, McDonald's at UBC.ca. Hopefully, uh, you guys can see that as well. Yeah, feel free if, if you got any particular questions, your program, your team, um, your son or daughter, things like that, feel free. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, yeah, just send some emails back and forth and, and provide any resources that I might have. Can people hear me? Perfect. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the OBA, thank you, Terry, for taking the time uh, to share your wealth of knowledge in this uh, field. Um, this is something that we're really starting to be cognizant of, uh, I would say, in the club system as well. Uh, strength and conditioning programs are coming out of the Woodworks Left Rain Center, I find, with clubs now. Um, and we would just like to thank Kerry for sharing his input here. Um, the recording I caught uh, about 10 minutes into it, but it'll be available on our website. And please, like I said at the beginning, uh, check our website for uh, the upcoming ones. Um, and it's great uh, to have you all here, and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you, Kerry.